Hello and welcome to Vaults of Terror. My name is Ed and today we're going to be continuing our Space Marine Armoury videos with the Space Marines vehicles. Now the Space Marines vehicles are by necessity different to those of the vehicles of the rest of the Imperium. Their vehicles are far more advanced like the rest of their armoury and thus require a completely different section to talk about than that used by other Imperial armies. Now Space Marine vehicles can be divided into broad categories that I'll be going through along with different marks that I'll need to talk about later. So let's get started by talking about the Space Marine bike. Now, Space Marine bikes are very similar to modern day bikes, but scaled up by a massive degree. They are incredibly deadly and robust, and used by Space Marine bike squads to make lightning quick raids and perform reconnaissance on the battlefield. Now, they are equipped with very powerful engines which are required to propel a fully armoured Space Marine at very high speed, and they've got a very highly responsive control system, allowing them to perform complex battlefield manoeuvres. They are also operated in a wide range of environments, from dune seas to ice-strewn wastelands and rocky moonscapes. They are a very simple design and can be repaired by their rider if needs be. The typical armament of a Space Marine bike are two bolters mounted either side of the headlights of the vehicle, and are controlled via thumb studs on the control mechanism. There is another version of the Space Marine bike known as the Space Marine Attack Bike. Now this is almost identical to a normal Space Marine bike, but has a difference in having a sidecar attached. Now this allows the sidecar to be armed with more heavy weaponry, such as a heavy bolter and a multi-melter. Now this needs to be operated by a second Marine, but in essence it makes it a moving weapons platform, allowing the Space Marines to deploy heavy weaponry very quickly into the battlefield, without sacrificing any of the maneuverability that a Space Marine bike usually has. Moving on from Space Marine bikes, we go on to something that's a little more for first millennium, and that are land speeders. Now, contrary to their rather simple name, land speeders are light anti-gravity vehicles. They serve as the primary reconnaissance unit, scouting and resupplying Space Marines whilst having a fast attack method allowing them to deploy very quickly to any place in the battlefield, faster, in fact, than a Space Marine bike. Now the history of land speeders is that they are based on a standard template construct which was discovered in Millennium 31 by the famous techno-archaeologist Arkan Land and afterwards became widely produced throughout the Imperium. Land speeders were also used by the Imperial Guard, but since the plasma and anti-gravity technologies required to use them have become increasingly rare and harder to maintain, it is only the Space Marines themselves who are able to continue using land speeders to any great degree on the battlefield. Now the design of the Space Marines land speeder is relatively complex despite its simple look from the outside. The anti-gravitic plates which give the Space Marine land speeder its ability to fly are a mystery to most of the Imperium. Only the Adeptus Mechanicus has the technical knowledge in order to maintain them. They are placed around the nose and cockpit of the vehicle and create the inverse gravity field which in combination with the afterburning ramjets allow it to climb to a height of over 100 meters. Though its anti-gravitic plates won't function at any higher altitude, they can be used to perform a controlled descent from heights higher than this, allowing the deployment of landspeeders from overflying Thunderhawk gunships for a rapid assault. The general Space Marine landspeeder is very lightly armoured, indeed the power armour of the Space Marines actually provides more protection than the armour of the vehicle. It instead relies on its speed of manoeuvrability to avoid enemy fire. Its primary armament is a heavy bolter, although that can be replaced in some landspeeders with a multi-melter for more anti-armour firepower. The advantages of a landspeeder is that it can fulfil many tasks on the battlefield, and thus can fulfil many different roles. These can range from light reconnaissance tasks to tank hunting and search and destroy operations of heavy heavy enemy vehicles. Now land speeders are typically fielded in squadrons of one to three vehicles, and normally are piloted by an assault marine, who has the most experience in piloting in the space marines ranks, with each battle group maintaining its own stockpile of land speeders. However, the majority of the land speeders are held by the chapter's reserve companies, with the seventh company trained and equipped to deploy en masse on land speeders, acting as a fast response strike group, which can be used to respond to enemy penetrations or exploit a hole in the battlefield lines. On average, the typical chapter will have between 50 and 70 land speeders of various types, although this will depend upon the chapter's wealth or tactical doctrine. For example, the Dark Angels and White Scars, along with their successor chapters, fill several hundred land speeders on the battlefield. Now we move on to the four different variants of the land speeder. The first is the Tornado. Now the land speeder Tornado is very heavily armed, and it has a heavy flamer and heavy bolter for additional firepower. The heavy flamer can also be replaced with an assault cannon. Now the Landspeeder Typhoon, which is the second mark, is a more heavily armoured version of the standard Landspeeder, although not as, not as heavily armed as the Tornado, and they usually have a heavy bolter with twin-linked missile launchers at the back in order to provide long-range heavy support. 
Now, the third type of land speeder is the Tempest. Now, the land speeder Tempest is unique for being fully enclosed, foregoing the land speeder's long range patrol to become a dedicated gunship. Now, it was first used by the White Scars in Millennium 36 during the evacuation of Balak. The Landspeed de Tempest, led by veteran Sergeant Jegan, was credited with destroying a Reaver Titan that was about to overrun the chapter's command post. Sergeant Jegan was killed when the Reaver fell on his Tempest and destroyed it, but his heroic sacrifice started a tradition of White Scars naming a Tempest squadron Jegan's Avengers. Other chapters have used plans provided by the White Scars to create their own Tempests, such as the Dark Angel's Ravenwing, although they remain less common than the Tornadoes and Typhoons in those chapters. They are slightly larger than the standard land speeder, and it carries heavier armour and weapons. To save on the weight, the gunner is replaced by a slaved targeting system, with the pilot's aim assisted by the machine spirit. The weaponry includes a fixed forward assault cannon and twin-linked missile launchers controlled through a multispectral targeting surveyor. Despite the heavier armour, standard combat tactics remain the same, with Tempest flying nape to the earth to avoid enemy fire. Now the final type I wanted to mention was number four, the Storm. Now land speeder storms are significant modifications of the standard land speeder, designed to be used by chapter scouts. Although equal to the standard model in speed and maneuverability, it trades much of its heavy armour to carry space marines. Up to five scouts can be loaded on in the heat of battle. It is further altered with baffled engines as a sophisticated spy array, allowing for stealthy intersections behind allowing for stealthy insertions behind enemy lines. The standard bolter is replaced by many chapters with a Cerberus launcher, a tri-barreled missile launcher capable of shooting frag, stun, or blind rockets. It is also equipped with advanced jamming beacons that operate both electromagnetically and on the etheric bands, allowing for it to create interference on enemy communications and cause teleport homers to malfunction within its area of effect. The exact origins of this land speeder are unknown. It has seen extensive use by the Ultramarines and Raven Guard, along with its successors, and so is thought to be one of their inventions. Conversely, the storm is almost unheard of within the armories of the Space Wolves and the Blood Angels. Now we move on to a staple of the Space Marines armory, which is actually a tank called the Rhino. Now, the Rhino is a tracked armoured troop carrier, primarily used by the Space Marines. Their Rhino's versatile design has allowed it to be developed mostly through the discovery of an SGC through several different variants and can fulfil many different tactical roles. Now, its origins are way back in the dawn of human history, long before the foundation of the Imperium. There have been many different speculated dates of the Rhino's foundation, but it is definitely before the Age of Strife, sometime in the early ages of the Dark Age of Technology, when humanity was moving across new star systems across the galaxy. Its original designation was RH-1-N-0, Tracked Exploration and Multipurpose Defense Vehicle, and it was used widely on newly colonized planets. It was first fuel tested on Mars and was known to be a runaway success, thanks to its extreme dependability and capability of being produced from any local variant material, as well as being able to make use of any semi-combustible fuel source. Its military value was soon discovered, and each planet in the small human empire had its own custom versions of the Rhino, fitted with varying weapons. The earliest evidence of the Rhino in combat was at Torben's world, in a battle against the indigenous alien population. During the attack, 300 Rhinos were deployed to the largest alien city. The speed of the assault meant the Xenos had no idea of the coming of the humans, and had not prepared any defences. The Rhinos poured their firepower into the flimsy structures, and then deployed nearly 3,000 warriors. The city was destroyed, and the alien presence was removed, allowing the colonisation to proceed easily. The news of the victory spread across human space, and the Rhino was adopted by more and more planets. Now, during the Dark Age of Technology, the STC was lost concerning the construction of a Rhino. Thus, the ability to construct these vehicles was lost on many worlds. They became holy relics for many, and some reached thousands of years of age during their operational period. Eventually, the STC was rediscovered on printouts, hard copy blueprints, which are almost unheard of, discovered by the Adeptus Mechanicus, and allowing the construction of Rhinos to resume. In the early Imperium, the Rhino was a far more ubiquitous vehicle, employed by most Imperial military forces. Since then, the knowledge of its construction has again faded, and so the employment of the Rhino has been limited to the Space Marines and a few other Imperial organisations. Now, only the Adeptus Mechanicus possesses the knowledge to build the Rhino, although it could be easily built by any world in the Imperium if they had the design schematics. Each Rhino is purified and blessed, each piece appeased before being put in place. Should a Rhino be lost in battle, it will be salvaged and repaired, having been sent back out to give the machine spirit a chance of retribution against its enemies. At its most basic level, the Rhino Mark IIc is an armoured carrier with large tracks designed to cope with any terrain and protect its passengers from harm. It is such a basic design 
constructed from almost any material and powered by any semi-combustible material, that little has changed throughout its 10,000 year history with the Imperium, such as its resilience that damage sustained in battle can be often repaired on the field by the crew themselves. Now its armament is very small, it is designed as a carrier and not a weapons vehicle, and thus it usually has a storm bolter attached to the top which is usually pendle mounted, although it can have certain other weapons if it is needed, although those usually are included on other types of rhino type vehicle. Now the armour is a common form of armouring in the Imperium using bonded ceramite over a cast layer of plasteel. However, other materials have been known to be used instead from composite carbon compounds to conventional hardened steel. The Rhino is actually powered by four Mark II Mars pattern adaptable thermactic combustion reactor engines. The engines are all fed by fan assisted air intakes and each one is hooked into a dynamo that in turn is connected via power coupling to two electric motors which power the vehicle's batteries. Each engine also has its own fuel tank and air supply to use if necessary, i.e. fighting in a toxic atmosphere or in a vacuum. This level of redundancy means that should one engine be disabled, power reduction will be minimal. If both engines on one side are lost, the remaining two can still power the drive wheels through the auxiliary drive shaft and locking differential, although the rhino speed will be cut in half. Should all four engines be destroyed, electrical energy stored in the vehicle's batteries recharge all the electric motors, can be used to continually operate the vehicle for a short period of time. In addition, most rhinos include rudimentary self-repair systems able to restore motive and drive functions. This basic design feature lends towards the Rhino's reputation as a rugged carrier able to move after suffering damage that would cripple lesser vehicles. Now its transport capability is well known as it can carry up to 10 power armoured space marines, although it's not equipped to handle any terminator armour or jump pack equipped space marines. The two side hatches and rear ramp allow for a quick exit, while the top hatch allows for two passengers to fire from the Rhino in addition to serving as an emergency escape hatch. Now there are older designs of Rhinos. The oldest surviving Rhino pattern is the Mark 1B, which was produced in such numbers that many surviving examples still exist. However, these machines are considered past their prime and no longer constructed, although they are still used with honour and respect. Compared to the Mark II C pattern, the Mark I's drive and engine systems is less robust, lacking the same redundancy systems. However, it has a slightly higher top speed, load bearing capacity, and requires less maintenance time. Now, there is another variant of the basic Rhino to be mentioned, and that is the Damocles Command Rhino. Now, it is a Rhino based command vehicle used for large scale space marine operations, which are very rare. It is an example of the kind of advanced technology available to space marines. It is used only in operations where command and control of significant space marine formations is required, such as a battle group consisting of a battle company plus support elements. The Damocles provides a communication link between the force commander, his battle group, and any air or orbital assets operating in the area. For this reason, the Damocles is rarely committed to the front line, and is typically hidden away to prevent enemy interference. In addition to the driver, the Damocles is crewed by a communications officer and a tactical officer. These space marines will have undergone additional training with the chapter's tech marines in order to operate the very sophisticated technology which is included in the Damocles. There is also room for the force commander next to the driver, allowing for him to keep updated on the developing situations on the battlefield. The equipment of the vehicle is packed with some of the most advanced technology available to the Imperium. It can mount secure multiband communication gear and acts as a communication hub for a battle group, but with signal boosters allowing for ground to orbital comlinks as well as the ability to communicate with other Imperial command units operating in the area. It can also monitor, intercept and decrypt enemy communication, which in addition to a multispectral allspex allows it to track enemy movements. Link up with an orbital array allows the Damocles to track individual squads and vehicles for an entire chapter, as well as biostatus readouts provided directly from the Marine's power armour. Finally, the Damocles includes a teleport homer, which produces a strong signal allowing for safe, more accurate teleportation onto the battlefield. Now moving on from the Damocles, we need to talk about another variant which is almost a scaled up Rhino, known as the Razorback. Now the Razorback is based on a Rhino chassis and such is quite easy to manufacture, sharing many of the design features. It is sometimes favoured over Rhinos because of its superior firepower, although this comes at the cost of transport space. Because this redesign was discovered after the Horus Heresy, the Traitor Legions do not produce any Razorbacks as they do not have the technology to manufacture them. A history of the the history of the Razorback is that there was originally a variant of the Predator battle tank designed to carry troops and it is thought to be the pre
precursor to modern Razorbacks. However, the STC template for the Razorback was first discovered on Mars in M36 by chief artisan Tilvius, whilst he was exploring the southern rim of the galaxy. When he returned to Mars, the Adeptus Mechanicus recognised it from earlier records and commenced on its construction. Within 200 years, the first Razorbacks were field tested and began seeing service with the Adeptus Astartes. Now, the Razorback has a variety of tactical uses. Some chapter masters are weary of using the Razorback, partly because it is a relatively recent machine, only 4,000 years old. They also believe it fails as a troop transport and a battle tank, lacking the transport capacity or firepower and armour of dedicated machines. Others seeing it as filling a gap between the two, able to provide heavy fire support for squads assaulting the enemy, freely mixing Rhino and Razorbacks together. Further uses include providing escort for armoured tanks and heavy reconnaissance in cooperation with bike-mounted troops. Now, its design is very similar to the Rhino, however it has several significant changes. The standard armament consists of a twin-linked heavy bolter mounted on a turret on top of the vehicle, which is not included in the Rhino. The turret is normally a remote-controlled device using targeting logistic engines similar to those found in the Land Raiders. Some Razorbacks lack this system, however, and so a second crewman is added to the man the weapon, protected from enemy fire by a gun shield, although this is on several of the older marks of Razorback. The ability to transport marines is reduced in a Razorback due to the fact it requires armament and ammunition for its armament. It allows them to carry six space marines in power armour, although none in terminator armour and again none with assault packs. The Razorback has some access points at the side and back, however it lacks fire points due to the turret mounted weapon. Now we move on to a staple of the Space Marine battle tanks, the Predator. Now the Predator is far more heavily armed and armoured than the Rhino. There are two major patterns of Predator, each differing essentially in their specific weaponry. Beside the two common patterns, the Blood Angels and their successor chapters employ an assault-oriented Baal Predator. Construction of Predators remains restricted to a chapter's armoury or allied forge world, with most chapters fielding between 20 to 30 of all types. However, some chapters are known to contain several hundred battle tanks, although that number includes land raiders as well. The Predator shares many of the same design features as the Rhino, along with some significant differences which are scaled up from the Razorback. Now, the, now the first mark of Predator that I need to talk about is the Predator Destructor. It is believed to be the original model for the Predator battle tanks, with its origins dating back to the Dark Age of Technology. Now, the Predator was built in direct response to the threat of Orcs, which were proving difficult for humanity to handle. Its combination of heavier armour and weaponry allowed the Predator to withstand the Orcish attacks, and easily destroyed their vehicles. Soon the Predator became the standard fighting vehicle for all of humanity's armies, and will remain in that position throughout the Great Crusade, where its small troop carrying capacity would be replaced by extra ammunition. Eventually, the Predator Destructor, like the Rhino, would be restricted to the Space Marines due to its usage being highly restricted by the Adeptus Mechanicus. And the main armament on the common Mars pattern Predator Mark 6B Predator Destructor is the Syrtis pattern autocannon, which is constructed with an automatic ammunition feed, muzzle flash suppressor, and discharge extractor. The weapon is aimed by the vehicle commander slash gunner through the multispectral remote targeting surveyor and accuracy talisman. It fires explosive ammunition, each round larger than the Space Marine's fist, which easily chew through heavily armoured infantry and light vehicles. The side sponsors can mount either heavy bolters for close defence or las cannons for additional anti-tank firepower. The sponsors' weapons are remotely controlled from the turret and aimed through similar surveyors. Now the armour of the Predator Destructor comes from three layers. The first is a bonded ceramite adamantium alloy, which gives the Predator protection equivalent to five times its width in conventional steel whilst being lighter. This is followed by a thermoplast layer with a mesh of subdermal energy dissipation fibre for protection against radiation. The outer layer is a non-metallic acrylic identification stealth layer used to prevent radar from picking it up easily. There are other known patterns of the Predator structure, the initial one being known as the Phaeton pattern Mark 3 b c it's an older variant, which is actually based on a Mark I Rhino chassis. Its distinctive, squ its distinctive square turret is actually mounted forward on the hull, and thus is very clearly identifiable in relation to the Mars pattern that has its turret mounted at the back of the vehicle. Now we move on to the Predator Annihilator. It is the second and latter of the two major patterns for the Space Marines, and is actually designed by the Space Wolves chapter, although its introduction was not without controversy. The model did not appear until Millennium 36. 
in the Scarath Crusade. The Adeptus Mechanicus was infuriated by the Spaceworld's blasphemous alteration of a holy STC design in order to create the Predator Annihilator. However, their success could not be denied. While Space Wolves continued to field the Predator Annihilator, the Tech Priests examined the design, debated its sanctity in councils, and ran extensive trials. Over 200 years later, it was found the modified tank was not only acceptable to the Machine God, but the Predator was intentionally designed to accept such a retrofit. The Predator Annihilator has since found its way into armories of many other Space Marine chapters, although not as extensively as the Space Wolves. The armament is significantly changed from the auto cannon used on the Predator Destructor. It actually mounts twin Stormbringer LAS cannons equipped with flash dampeners and focusing rings. Powered by diaquartzoid crystal batteries, each LAS cannon barrel has a life of 1,000 shots before it warps and must be replaced. Now, to move on from the Predators, we need to move on to another Rhino based vehicle, which is the Vindicator. Now, I have mentioned the Vindicator in the Space Marine armament video, and thus I won't go into too much detail here, but I just wanted to give a little bit more background to the tank rather than just the weapon. Now, it's a short range siege tank based upon the Rhino chassis and shares many of the same design features, with equipment designed to deliver heavy ordnance at short range. The origin of the Vindicator is fragmentary, although the earliest records show it to be developed along with the other Rhino STC variants during the Dark Age of Technology. Other records show that the Vindicator was first fielded during the early years of the Horus Heresy on Rosteran 1, when massive thunder cannons were mounted on remodelled Rhinos and used to blast heavily dug in traitor positions among the urban rubble. Since the heresy, the bulky thunder cannon has been replaced with a more bulky but no less compact demolisher cannon, along with other minor field modifications through the armouring, fire control and drive systems. The Vindicator has become a vital part of the chapter's siege and urban combat capabilities, with most retaining a dozen or so vehicles within their armoury. Now, The tactical use of the Vindicator is laid down in the Codex Astartes. Its chief role is urban combat to provide assault and tactical squads with destructive firepower against enemy strong points and snipers. Standard combat doctrine is that the vehicle advances down the street towards the target structure, supported by Space Marine squads advancing from building to building on either side of it, blasting holes in walls if necessary. Once in position, the Vindicator opens fire on the target building, reducing much of it to rubble and opening the way for subsequent assaults by Space Marines with close combat weaponry. Outside the urban combat, the Vindicator also sees a limited role in tank warfare, with many armoured thrusts containing at least one Vindicator for close quarter engagement. For particularly hardened targets, Vindicators will be formed into line-breaking squadrons, combining their firepower for impressive effects. Now I'll just move on to the technical information slightly. Now moving on to the tactical information about the Vindicator, the Demolisher Cannon has been mentioned before, and if you want to know more about it, do see the description in the Space Marines Weapons Room video. The Rhino's classic transport capacity is given over completely to the ammunition storage for the Demolisher Cannon, of which it can carry 16 shells in its racks. This number is normally increased by two, with one shell pre-loaded and a second stored on the collapsible loading ramp. The Vindicator is also armed with a Storm Bolter for anti-infantry firepower, although this can be removed if necessary. The armour is also different from the original Rhino design. In order to survive the brutal close quarters fighting typical of urban warfare, Vindicators have a much thicker armour compared to the standard Rhino, especially along its front top facings. This armour is further supported by extra bracing, which adds additional weight to the frame, and thus does slow the vehicle down slightly, although this is counteracted by the fact it can fire at a decent range. Moving on to another artillery tank used by the Space Marines, based on the Rhino's design, we are now talking about the Whirlwind artillery tank. It's one of the few indirect fire vehicles used by the Space Marines beside the Land Raider Helios. The Whirlwind provides accurate support for suppression of numerous highly mobile targets. Because it is derived from STC technology discovered after the Horus Heresy, the Whirlwind is unavailable to Chaos Space Marines. The primary mark of Whirlwind used by the Space Marines is the Whirlwind Helios. Based on the Rhino chassis, the Whirlwind is both fast and mobile, able to keep up with the Space Marine battle group. Because the number of Whirlwinds available to a chapter is limited, typically between 20 and 30 for most, the ability to engage the enemy and rapidly change positions to avoid counter-battery fire is prized. Its target acquisition and telemetry gear also allows for a Whirlwind to engage the enemy from behind cover with far better accuracy than conventional artillery. Although the Helios pattern is the most common type of Whirlwind in use, there are many differences between most Whirlwinds, basically because of how many missiles can be fired. When fully loaded, the Helios missile launcher carries six missiles. However, because these missiles must be manually reloaded, the Whirlwind must withdraw after firing in order to rearm. In spite of this, the transport capacity inherited from the Rhino allows for a large ammunition stockpile, and some chapters equip each vehicle with a servitor dedicated to speeding up the reloading time. When required to provide indirect fire support against mass targets over long ranges, Whirlwinds also form into suppressor forces with, with land speeders modified to function as artillery spotters. 
There is also another type of whirlwind I want to mention, which is the whirlwind Hyperios. Now, the Hyperios is a specialised version of the standard whirlwind used by many chapters, and it is an anti-aircraft vehicle. Instead of the typical armament of other whirlwinds, the Hyperios mounts a missile launcher along with automated tracking and targeting equipment dedicated to shooting down enemy aircraft. It's greatly efficient against low-flying enemy craft making strafing runs. In a pinch, the Hyperios can be used to attack ground units, although this is very, very rare as it is a very, very ineffective method of dealing with ground targets. Now, I've talked about the Rhino variants of tank available to Space Marines, but now I want to move on to an iconic vehicle which can be recognised, the Imperium Over, and that is the Land Raider. Now, the Land Raider is a very heavy tank and can transport primarily Space Marines. It is capable of operating in virtually any kind of planetary environment. Its hull fully isolates its occupants from the environment and provides life support functions, allowing operation on inhospitable and airless worlds. Now, the Land Raider is designed to move at good speed while still carrying heavy armaments as well as a number of warriors within its armoured hull. It is a standard template construct vehicle, and a modern pattern of Land Raider is the Land Raider Phobos. Now, the origins of the Land Raider are way back in the Dark Age of technology, like many of the Space Marine vehicles. It is thought that when humankind expanded out of its home system, the construction method was incorporated into the great STC systems, allowing for it to be built locally by colonists, even if they lacked great technical knowledge. With the widespread breakdown of human civilization during the Age of Strife, production of the vehicle ceased. However, during the Great Crusade, the Land Raider STC design was rediscovered, allowing their manufacture. The discovery is commonly believed to be from the techno-archaeologist Arkham Land, who I mentioned before. He travelled the Imperium and recovered many STC designs, including the Land Raider pattern. These vehicles were incorporated into the arsenals of the Imperium's forces, used by both the Space Marine legions and the Imperial Army. Such was the demand for the Land Raider that the entire Forge world, and Tavilus 9, was devoted entirely to Land Raider production, supplying thousands upon thousands of Land Raiders for the Emperor's forces. However, at the onset of the Horus Heresy, Antivelus IX, along with the other Forge Worlds, were seized by the renegade tech priests aligned with Horus, while others chose to cede from the Imperium and remain neutral. This would prove to be a terrible blow for the Loyalists as the supply of Land Raiders began to dry up, especially since the sufficient numbers the Land Raiders can take on and destroy even Titans. When the Clouds of Rebellion drew closer to Terror, the Emperor ordered that all Land Raiders still in Loyalist service were to be transferred and used exclusively by the Legions of Astartes who were at the forefront of the fighting. The Emperor was never able to actually annul this order, and consequently, even after the Horus Heresy, the use of the Land Raider remains exclusively to the Space Marines. Now, in the 41st millennium, the Land Raider has gone through several modifications of the original design. It has many marks and variants. According to the organisational guidelines laid down by the Codex Astartes, the Land Raider is only used by the first company of Space Marine chapters. However, some less orthodox chapters are known to use it more widely, and the Salamanders chapter uses an altered version of the Codex Astartes with 12 squads in the first company instead of 10, increasing the maximum number of Land Raiders available to 12. Land Raiders can also form into armoured spearheads designed to put holes through enemy lines and allow penetration into rear areas. Now, there are many features to the Land Raider's design. It is armed with a hull-mounted twin-linked heavy bolter and two side sponsons, each with twin-linked las cannons. It may also be fitted with pintle-mounted storm bolters. Sponsoned weapons are controlled through slave-remoted targeting systems and aimed through multispectral optical periscopes located around the turret rings. The las cannons are the Godhammer KZ 9.76 design, requiring the replacement barrels after 2,000 shots. Now, the armour of the Land Raider is legendary. It uses composite armour created by bonding layers in huge high-pressure cookers, giving it a level of protection incomparable with most other Imperial vehicles. The first armoured layer, in addition to structural supports, is constructed of adamantine. The second is a titanium plasteel composite used to reinforce strategic locations, such as the assault ramp, front glacis and hatch doors. The next is a thermoplast fibre mesh used to absorb and dissipate high-energy laser weapons, followed by two ceramite layers designed to ablate against extreme heat and melter weapons. When combined, this heavy armour actually makes the Land Raider virtually immune to heavy artillery, like battle cannons. Now, the engine system is also something worth mentioning on the Land Raider. It is powered by a Mars pattern highly adaptable thermatic combustor reaction engine situated in the rear of the vehicle. It is kept cool by nitro ammonium cooling systems and prevented from malfunction and demonic possession by Adeptus Mechanicus manufacturing sigils and purity seals. The engine provides power for all of the Land Raider systems and can propel it up to an on road speed of 55 km per hour. Now, every Land Raider is equipped with automatic control systems known as the Machine Spirit. Now, the machine spirit assists the crew in operating a tank, and in extreme circumstances, can operate the vehicle on its own. The most famous example of this is possibly the Land Raider Rin's Might, which, despite lacking any crew, proceeded to kill an orc warboss and his followers before eventually being destroyed. 
The Land Raider is hermetically sealed, allowing for it to operate in outer space or at the bottom of an ocean. It also includes atmospheric sampling equipment, air filtration and purification units, and rad counters for operation in hazardous environments. Each Land Raider also contains significant command and control equipment. The commander is able to see and monitor his unit's biostatus and be informed of other information through the squad status screens, using information transmitted by their power armour through the vehicle's communications dish. The commander also has access to a holographic tactical interface and can directly interface with the machine spirit. For security purposes, all the controls of the Land Raider are gene-coded to prevent any unauthorised use by the enemy. Now, as a transport vehicle, the Land Raider is impressive. It can carry 12 Space Marines, or 6 Terminators. Since it is hermetically sealed, the Land Raider has no fire points for embarked troops to use. Space Marines can exit from 3 access points around the front of the vehicle, 2 hatches on either side, and the main assault ramp which can disgorge troops directly into combat. Now, there are several other marks of Land Raider that I'll have to mention now, as they can come in many different shapes and sizes. There is the Land Raider Achilles, which is a Land Raider variant designed by the Imperial Fists in response to a former Xenos threat many ages ago. Because of its age and arcane construction, it is rarely found outside the Imperial Fists or their successor chapters. It is legendary for its durability, which is more than that of a standard Land Raider. The ancient technology going into making this variant's hull can reduce the effects of many attacks. This, combined with the standard equipment of the Land Raider, allows it to be a very powerful war vehicle. The Achilles is mainly used by the Imperial Fists or its successive chapters, and is also used by the Auto Reductor of the Adeptus Mechanicus. It is rarely seen in other Space Marine chapters. Now, its weapons and armament are slightly different from that of the standard Land Raider. The Achilles variant is armed with a Thunderfire Cannon, which can propel various kinds of tank shells at high speed. Its three different modes of standard airbust and subterranean armament can come in handy when fighting foes. It also comes with two side spots and twin linked multi melters, which gives it an advantage in close combat against enemy vehicles. The next mark I want to mention is the Land Raider Ares. Now, it is a Land Raider created by the Dark Angels chapter, and it was first used in the Siege of Ares when it was discovered by the Dark Angels that some of their chaotic brethren had taken control of the local forces. The Dark Angels found that their Vindicators could not withstand the great cannons of the city, and so created the Land Raider that could mount a Vindicator cannon, which is the primary armament of the Land Raider Ares. Next is the Land Raider Crusader, and this is one of the most ubiquitous Land Raider vehicles next to that of the standard Phobos pattern. Now, the Land Raider Crusader is an assault-based version of the Land Raider. It has several modifications allowing it to assist warriors assaulting out of the front hatch. It has also much greater transport capacity due to the removal of many of the large energy generators needed to power the LAS cannons, and special frag charges to fill the air before it with lethal shrapnel and cover disembarking marines. The history of the Crusader is that it was originally designed by the Black Templars to provide vast amounts of anti-infantry fire before Disgorging Black Templars to mow down the survivors. It was designed during the Juralius Crusade, the year 645 of the Millennium 39, by Artificer Sigmatus, using recovered ancient techno arcana in the long forgotten depths of a captured hive city. As tales of the Crusader's successes spread, many other chapters began to request information regarding its remodelling. The Tech Priests of Mars officially recognised the Crusader pattern in 763 Millennium 39, although this was a mere formality since the design had already spread to hundreds of chapters. Now, some technical information about the Crusader. It is armed with one twin-linked assault cannon, two sets of hurricane pattern bolters on the side sponsors, and one pintle mount of multi-melter, making it a deadly close combat weapon. Now, its transport capacity has been expanded to 16 Space Marines in power armour, or 8 Space Marines in Terminator armour, making it a very lethal assault vehicle. The Crusader has one additional unique upgrade in the form of frag launchers situated either side of the front entrance or exit ramp. These are designed to fire shrapnel at an entrenched enemy to aid the transport unit's chances when leaving the vehicle. One of the later patterns of Land Raider I now want to talk about is the Land Raider Helios. Now, the Land Raider Helios is a variant designed as a stopgap measure for long-range artillery support. Since its first introduction, it has been adopted by a number of chapters, although it still remains an uncommon sight on the battlefield. In Millennium 38, the year 857 to be precise, the Red Scorpions were embroiled in a legendary siege of Helios, where they found themselves lacking in sufficient artillery to breach the walls or suppress the defenders in the sector. The Red Scorpions, being an especially insular and independent chapter, refused to call upon the local Imperial Guard. Instead, the chapter master directed his Master of the Forge to produce a solution. In response, they converted all 12 of their Land Raiders into what became known as Helios Patterns. The Land Raider Helios, in combination with the chapter's whirlwinds, proceeded to knock down the offending walls and assault the defenders with success. Now, what differs the Helios from standard Land Raiders is the addition of a whirlwind multiple assault launcher beside the two twin-linked LAS cannons. The trade-off is that some of the transport capacity is given over to the new missile storage. The Helios pattern can only carry six Space Marines in power armour and only three Terminators. 
Now, one of the last uh, patterns of Land Raider I want to mention is the Land Raider Proteus. Now, the Proteus contains extraordinarily powerful augury systems, allowing it to scan the battlefield for conditions with extreme precision. Due to this improvement, it has been thought that this tank is the origin of all modern Land Raider designs, intended to explore and conquer new worlds. Its sensor systems make it useful as both a command tank and the leader of an armoured spearhead. However, due to the fact that it lacks a forward assault ramp and has lower troop capacity, as well as being harder to reproduce, it makes it a rare sight in the 41st millennium. Despite all this, it's valued as a war relic by many Space Marine chapters lucky enough to own them. Now, the Proteus is armed with two side spons and twin link LAS cannons, as well as additional auguries and cogitators in order to direct and explore the battlefield. Now, the one I want to mention briefly is the Land Raider Redeemer. Now, the Redeemer is an assault based version of the Land Raider, very similar to the Land Raider Crusader from which it evolved. The Redeemer variant has several modifications which, though decrease the transport capacity, assist the warriors in assaulting from within. Unlike the Crusader, this variant supports assaulting Astartes with flame rather than bolts with a flame storm cannon. Now, the origins of the Redeemer was that it was created by the Fire Lords chapter, a subchapter of the Salamanders under the command of Jarek Foros on the planet of Grissom. Finding themselves in the midst of a planet-wide civil war, the Space Marines made little progress against the natives. The rebels were so entrenched that even the most devastating orbital bombardments were made to scant impact on their positions. Since exterminatus was not an option, Foros bit back his mounting frustration and directed his tech marines to construct a weapon that would win the war. With a month of the first Land Raiders modifications, the largest planetary faction was suing for peace, and Grissom was part of the Imperium once more. In the wake of the Grissom campaign, the Foros was disseminated with its new design schematics to many other chapters. Now, some technical information about the Redeemer. It consists of one twin-linked assault cannon and two flamestorm cannons, each on each side sponsor. In all other essences, it is actually a standard Land Raider, although it has a standard capacity compared to the Crusader. Now, there is actually one more Land Raider I wish to mention, which was not the most wide-ranging, but is also something of a sub-Land Raider, and that is the Land Raider Prometheus. Now, the exact origins of the Prometheus is a mystery. Some tech adepts believe it to be a variant of the Tartarus pattern Land Raider due to the striking similarities between the two, although no evidence has been found to support this claim. Others believe that it was the Salamanders which first produced it, and they retained four Prometheus models, more than any other chapter. However, the Salamanders have denied this claim. In any case, the number of chapters which do have the Prometheus within their ranks is actually unknown. The most famous example of a Prometheus is actually used during the Marcelli campaign, when Captain Cato Sicarius used his Prometheus to turn the tide of battle against the Elder Pirates, in the process earning the first class marksman on a badge. Now, there are several design differences between the Prometheus and a normal Land Raider. The LAS cannons are replaced by twin linked heavy bolters, with pintle mounted storm bolters replacing the hull mounted heavy bolters. These changes are necessary to make room for the additional command and control equipment. Supplementing the Land Raider's tactical holosphere and squad status displays is a set of gear very similar to that found in the Damocles Command Rhino, although it is not as extensive. It still allows for the Prometheus to coordinate between the battle group and allied forces, intercept and decrypt enemy communications, and track movements with multispectral Auspex gear. The trade-off comes with the fact that the Prometheus still functions as a frontline combat vehicle, allowing the Space Marine Commander to lead from the front. The Prometheus's transport capacity is only slightly diminished, able to carry 10 Space Marines or 5 Terminators. Now, in talking about all this, I have realised there is one other Land Raider I do want to mention, although this is indeed the most minor of Land Raiders I think I could find, and that is the Terminus Ultra. Now, the Terminus Ultra pattern of Land Raider is an anti-armour vehicle. It is equipped with three twin-linked LAS cannons and two individual LAS cannons. The amount of energy these weapons require means the Terminus must forego the ability to carry troops in order to produce the power. The Terminus pattern is deployed almost exclusively to counter enemy super heavies, where the immense power power can be used to destroy all but the largest, most powerful war engines that the Space Marines may encounter, i.e. Titans. Now I mentioned all the Space Marine Land Raider variants I can think of, we must move on to a few different types of vehicle which the Space Marine use, which are not always tanks. One of these, which I failed to mention on many occasions past, is the Space Marine Dreadnought. Now the Space Marine Dreadnought is actually a large walking vehicle, similar to a tank almost, which carries the most powerful guns and lethal close combat weaponry, armoured to withstand all but the most powerful of enemy firepower, and is often relied on by Space Marine forces to tear an opening in enemy defences which a tank cannot reach. Each Dreadnought contains a living Space Marine, permanently interfaced with the machine through a form of Mind Impulse Unit, or MIU. Dreadnoughts are surprisingly agile, able to walk and balance with the ease of a living creature. The pilots within the Dreadnoughts have suffered mortal wounds in battle, and thus are not fully active Space Marines. They are maimed and crippled beyond recovery. Instead, 
of being mercifully killed, however, the greatest of heroes are instead given what is considered an honour in continuing to serve the Emperor past their normal lifespan. Once interred within a dreadnought, the Marine cannot leave the metal womb and is destined for a life of endless battle until it is destroyed. Some of these dreadnoughts are so ancient that their memories extend back to the founding of their chapters, and for this reason they are revered not only as powerful warriors, but as ageless forebears and living epitomes of battles they fought long ago. If a dreadnought is destroyed, the space marines will fight to retrieve the armoured shell so that the occupant inside can be returned to the chapter's mausoleum for a long-deserved final rest. The dreadnought mechanics themselves are ancient, the oldest dating back 10,000 years to the age of strife. Because the art of constructing them has now almost been lost, dreadnoughts are revered as some of the rarest machines in the Space Marine Armoury. They are armoured with ceramite and adamantium, their muscles are formed of electrofiber bundles and magna coils. They are usually armed with weapons to suit a particular role, such as destroying heavily armoured vehicles. Although a dreadnought can be damaged and disabled, it can survive unless the actual armoured tomb in which the Space Marine is contained is destroyed or damaged. When they are not fighting, a chapter's tech marine will allow the fallen heroes to sleep away the centuries until once more they are called into battle. And the armour can vary hugely on each individual dreadnought, allowing it to fulfil virtually every role that is needed by the space marines. Now, usually they will be armed with one ranged or one close combat weapon, although this can differ. The most common armament is an assault cannon and a power fist, which on a dreadnought is far more impressive than that on a space marine. Now, this can be modified to have two close combat weapons, which is common on some of the Blood Angels variant of Dreadnought, or they can have twin linked versions of ranged weapons, or in fact two different ranged weapons in order to provide a greater ranged support. They can have auto cannons, las cannons, heavy bolters, multi melters, plasma cannons, or assault cannons. They can all even have storm bolters or heavy bolters attached to their assault weapons, and can even have a missile launcher, although this is very rare as it does restrict a Dreadnought to ranged combat, although this is usually a little bit beyond what is required. Now, there is a sub-pattern of Dreadnought I want to mention, which is the Contemptor pattern of Dreadnought. Now, it was developed prior to the Horus Heresy, so is the oldest pattern of Dreadnought available. It is also larger and more powerful than the standard Dreadnought. It features similar systems to those used by the Adeptus Mechanicus Automatons, known as the Legio Cybernetica, and include field generator technology that would be implemented into storm shields on Space Marine Terminators later. And if you want to hear more about them, you'll have to look at my Space Marine Close Combat Armory video. The Contemptor pattern comes with twin-linked heavy bolters, a Dreadnought Close Combat weapon, and an inbuilt storm bolter and smoke launchers. The Contemptor can replace its standard equipment with a variety of weaponry such as the Dreadnought can, including multi-melters, heavy flamers and plasma cannons, or in fact twin-linked las cannons. The Contemptor can also replace its inbuilt storm bolter with a heavy flamer. Now I've mentioned the land vehicles, which I include the land speeder into that category, I will now mention some of the air vehicles featured by the Space Marines, which are also some of the most iconic vehicles in the entire Space Marines armory. Now I will mention one of the most iconic vehicles of the Space Marine air vehicles. Do I even have to say its name? Okay then, it is the Thunderhawk gunship, known by virtually everyone in the hobby and is of course very, very popular in the lore. Now, in the lore itself, the Thunderhawk gunship is a multi-use aircraft which is widely used by the Space Marine chapters. It is first deployed during the Great Crusade to replace the Warhawk 6 and is armed to the teeth with a Thunderhawk cannon and various other weapons, used becoming more and more widespread throughout the Great Crusade until it replaced virtually every other drop vehicle. Each chapter of the Space Marine maintains its own fleet of Thunderhawks, normally reserved for large-scale battles. They are time and time again used in various fields of war, and they are so well proven that they are ubiquitous with the terms of reliability in the Space Marine chapter. However, these vehicles are so powerful they are also only used in very great battles, as they are reserved for usually the deployment of very large squads in order to combat very large threats. Now, the design of the Thunderhawk is the most technologically sophisticated among any of the Imperial forces, and is such benefiting from a number of advanced systems. It is armed with a very large amount of weapons, although the configuration can vary from chapter to chapter. The primary weapon is also fitted on the top of the vehicle, known as a dorsal mount, and can have either a turbo laser destructor powerful enough to strike down even a scout titan with an accurate shot, or a modified battle cannon used for ground bombardments. It also has two las cannons mounted on either attack wing, and at least four heavy bolters in hull mounted twin link sponsons, with room for four additional heavy bolters under the main wingtips. In addition, each wing has three bomb pylons, each which carry one hellstrike missile, three bombs, or guided bombs, or an external fuel pod. This totals six missile pods or 18 bombs. All the Thunderhawk's weapon systems are controlled by the gunner through the remote multi spectrum surveyors from the flight deck with assistance provided by the machine spirit. 
Now its control system is through a pilot and co-pilot, along with a navigator and gunner, all located in the flight deck above the forward hold and in front of the upper hold. The navigator and the co-pilot also control the primary narrowband long-range communications transmitter located on top of the fuselage, along with the sensor array and electronic countermeasures. Navigator equipment also transmits information to the Space Marines command units, while an emergency locator beacon will automatically begin broadcasting if the Thunderhawk is shot down. Despite its complexity, the Thunderhawk systems are rugged and reliable and are controlled through an M33 Cyganus class machine spirit. Using atheric and Philogosian feed coils and alabamic shielding and pseudosynaptic rel relays, this machine spirit has a cogitation speed comparable to that found in a Reaver Battle Titan, further showing how complex this craft actually is. Now, the armour for the Thunderhawk is constructed similar to that of a Land Raider, giving unprecedented levels of protection. An adamantium inner hull is laid on top of titanium rolled plates, followed by thermoplast fibre mesh, and two layers of ceramite, the second of which is ablative. The ceramite and thermoplast layers are increased in depth to provide the craft with additional protection in order to perform repeated atmospheric entries, making them thicker than that on a land rotor, at the expense of thinning the titanium and adamantium layers. These armour layers make the Thunderhawk very well protected, and in particular resistant to melter weaponry. In addition to its armouring, the Thunderhawks also come equipped with a decoy flare launcher located in the lower rear fuselage, along with the electronic countermeasures used to jam enemy sensors and tracking equipment. Moving on to the engines which powered such a mighty beast, the Thunderhawk is equipped with a triple RX-92-00 Mars pattern, a combination rocket afterburning turbofans mounted on each wing and under the fuselage. In atmosphere, the turbofans provide enough thrust to propel the craft at approximately 2,000 km per hour, which is useful considering how unaerodynamic the vehicle actually is. When operating in space, however, the forward turbofan section is isolated from the exhaust and combustion chambers, where fuel from the onboard fusion reactor is pumped to create a high-pressure, high-velocity stream of gases which provide thrust. In addition, retro-exhaust nozzles are located around the Thunderhawk's hull to provide manoeuvrability in zero-gravity conditions. They also allow the craft to operate in hover mode when in atmosphere. For improved atmospheric handling, the gunship features two attack wings located above the main wings, which provide an additional directional stability when making attack runs. Their movement is synchronised and during normal flight are locked into position by bracing on the upper main wings, which are then released when the Thunderhawk approaches a target. Now related to its primary function, the transport capacity of a gunship can carry 30 power armoured space marines or half as many in Terminator armour, divided between the upper and forward holds. It can also carry a single dreadnought in a forward hold, takes the space of five space marines, or space marine bikes and attack bikes, which take up space equivalent to three or four space marines respectively. Embarked troops can enter or exit through the forward assault ramp or two access doors on either side of the forward hull. Now there are various usage and strategies used for the Thunderhawk which I will mention here. Now the Thunderhawk's engines allow it to drop into lower atmosphere without landing and it can be one of the most useful craft employed by the Space Marines. The ability to carry three full tactical squads with the precision a drop pod can't match, the Thunderhawk is used to insert Marines into the thick of the fighting, not just to destroy the enemy. Its tactical range and huge amount of firepower proved to be one of the most useful vehicles ever created. However, the Adeptus Mechanicus and the Tech Marines still hold the secrets of the creation of the Thunderhawk, not releasing them to the general public as they would prefer to keep the advantage with the Space Marines. Now the Thunderhawks can be used as attack craft, not just for ground attacks. Indeed, they are often launched in space battles, much like normal attack craft, where their firepower and space marine cargo make them potent additions to the space marine fleet. While slower than dedicated interceptors, Thunderhawks are able to outfight and outlast such craft, usually going twice as long as regular fighters before being forced to return to their mothership for refueling and rearming. While useful in its own right, this strength and endurance also means unlike most assault boats, Thunderhawks are more than capable of punching their way through enemy fighter screens delivering their deadly payload to a warship in a devastating hit and run boarding action without the need of a dedicated fighter escort to pave the way for them. Now, there is actually a main variant of the Thunderhawk, which is the Thunderhawk Transporter, and now it is a logical variation of the Thunderhawk and allows the Thunderhawk Transporter to carry battle tanks. Now it features similar design features to the original, but it's armed only with four twin-linked heavy bolters, although it can carry as many as six Hellstrike missiles along its hardpoints, and it's also propelled by four RX-92-00 combination rocket afterburn turbofans. 
The most notable difference is that it is missing the normal transport holes found on the Thunderhawk gunship. It is instead equipped with four massive magnetic clamping arms mounted on the runners underneath the fuselage. This allows the transport to carry two Rhino variants or one Land Raider sized vehicle, or an underslung pod designed to carry ammunition, fuel and other supplies. These items can be loaded and unloaded with a quick order, minimising the amount of time that the transporter is vulnerable whilst on the ground. Now, there are other types of vehicles used by the Space Marines which are less widely known to the Imperium at large, and of course ourselves. The first of which is the Storm Raven gunship. It is a relatively new addition to the armories of certain chapters, and it is most widely seen in chapters such as the Blood Angels or the Grey Knights. Now, seamlessly combining the roles of a dedicated gunship, dropship, and strike craft, it is unclear just how the craft came into being. There are rumours of an STC file discovered in the early 41st millennium in a long forgotten Martian archive, but there are equal evidence to suggest that the Storm Raven was seen with the Grey Knights at an even earlier date than that. Smaller than the Thunderhawk, the Storm Raven is not surprisingly much more agile than its well known sibling, thanks to its wide array of vectored thrusters. It is this manoeuvrability that makes it an ideal support craft for many environs such as crowded spires of a hive city, where the deployment of a Thunderhawk would be impractical. Now the weapons of a Storm Raven is mainly a twin-linked heavy bolter, a twin-linked assault cannon and four blood strike missiles, but it can be configured depending on the required mission parameters or simply the commander's personality. It may replace the heavy bolter with either a Typhoon missile launcher or twin-linked multi-melter, and the assault cannon for either a twin-linked plasma cannon or las cannon. Finally there is the choice of adding a pair of hurricane bolters to the side sponsor. Now the transport capacity for the Storm Raven is able to carry up to 12 armoured space marines or half a dozen assault marines, as well as a dreadnought being transported in the Space Marines' rear magna grapple. Now there is another type of gunship which is related to the Storm Raven, which is the Storm Talon. Now the Storm Talon is actually a one-man flyer which has no transport capacity used for both air-to-air -air interception and ground attacks. It is swift enough to engage most enemy aircraft. It also packs the armament of assault cannons, missiles and heavy bolters, along with other weapons. The Storm Talon is a versatile vehicle capable of serving as an escort fighter to protect Space Marine assets on the battlefield or a close air support attack craft. Now, one of the final vehicles in the Storm series of attack craft is the Storm Eagle. Now, this date backs to the Great Crusade and is designed to be a smaller attack craft to complement the Storm Birds and Thunderhawks that were used at that time. The legendary mobility of the Adeptus Astartes has won planet spanning conflicts with a single strike, providing the precise application of deadly force at the point where it is provided most decisive. Now, the attack craft is, of course, the keystone and that makes this possible, and it is the Thunderhawks and drop pods that provide this iconic speed. Now, Storm Eagle gunships follow these vehicles uh, and lend their weapons to devastating support, allowing Space Marines to deploy. The Storm Eagle is a formidable gunship and mounts fearsome firepower for a vehicle of its size, and it's capable of actually transporting 20 Space Marines into the thick of the assault, bridging the gap between the Thunderhawk and the Storm Raven. The exact providence of the Storm Eagle is unknown, but it bears clear similarities to Storm Ravens, of course, uh, that is employed by the Blood Angels and Grey Knights. Certain sources place the principal manufacturer of the Storm Eagle upon Digerus or Anvilius IX, both primary grade forge worlds that have suffered catastrophic damage during the Horus Heresy. In recent decades, the number of Storm Eagles in active service has begun to increase, especially among the chapters who have favourable relations with the Adeptus Mechanicus. This has led some observers to believe that the production of these vehicles has been restored at a yet unknown location. It's the Seistus Assault Ram. Now, the Seistus Assault Ram is one of the primary interstellar vehicles used by the Space Marines. It is used almost exclusively to board enemy ships, although it can actually be used as an orbital dropship when Thunderhawks are not actually available. The advantage being that the Seistus is actually smaller than a Thunderhawk gunship. The weapons of the Seistus is mainly Magna Melters, melter weapons used to penetrate hull plating, but can also be used against tanks, vehicles, and infantry, leaving devastation in its path. Some Seistus also have five Fury missile launchers, which launch all of its missiles in one shot, saturating the area of effect with smaller warheads. Because of its role as an assault ram, it has shield generators actually attached to the front, meaning it can resist attacks and impact collisions on the front hull, which can propel the assault ram faster than its standard speed, and extra armour for its role as an assault ram. It can transport 10 soldiers in power armour, artificer armour, or terminator armour. The deployment strategy for the Seistus is, as I mentioned before, you usually fly through the void of space, getting close to the target starship, and use its melter weaponry to pierce through the front hull as an assault ram, usually travelling at great speed. However, its small size, increased speed and heavily armour allows it to manoeuvre through very heavy fire zones and battlefields and complement soldiers on the ground, although again this is rare. To add to its assault capabilities, it has a teleport homer and frag launchers attached to the front, much like the Land Rouge Crusader, making it a potent transport vehicle in space and on the ground. Now, the final vehicle I want to mention today in this very long video this is a vehicle that I wouldn't define as an aircraft, but does fly through the air, and this is a drop pod. Now, the drop pods of the Adeptus Astartes look very similar to a lifeboat pod, but have a very different purpose. They can carry 12 normal space marines, a single dreadnought, or a single thunderfire cannon. They are launched from vessels in low orbit towards the drop zone, usually amidst or near a battlefield. 
Once launched, they plummet through the atmosphere until retrojets fire to slow their descent. A machine spirit usually guides the pod to its destination and can receive further commands from the mothership to alter its destination. Although the pods become immobile after having landed due to the fact they smash into the ground at high speed, they can be recovered by the chapter's tech marines and reused. They have numerous features which protect the space marines within, usually exuding some sort of foam into the cabin before impact, allowing space marines to survive very heavy collisions that would pulverise anything beneath the drop pod. Now there is one of the variants of the drop pod I wish to mention, and that is the Death Storm drop pod. Now these are a variant that don't carry troops but weapon systems installed to strafe enemy with high levels of fire once they have landed. They can be armed with whirlwind launchers or assault cannons and provide unique support to space marines when they believe they are trapped in very isolated conditions. Now, that is all the vehicles I wanted to mention today. I realise there are a few I've missed off just for the fact they are relatively either obscure or unnecessary. However, if you wish these vehicles to appear in another video, don't hesitate to leave a comment below. As I've said, I'm now rounding up these Space Marine Armoury videos with one final and very quick video related to Space Marine equipment that should come soon. And once we have those videos done, we'll be moving on to a few different topics which I'm sure you'll all be very happy to hear. Now, as I said, if there's anything you want to ask, don't hesitate to contact me. And I hope to see you soon on the Vaults of Terror. Thank you.